to hear from you and your experience with this topic. So the, the first question really is to introduce yourself. So I'm going to go with Nolana and tell us a bit about the statistics and the terminology of this topic. I see folks are using wandering, others are saying, you know, older adults are getting lost in their communities. What is the difference and how can we uh, start to talk about this? Thanks, Serena. And what I'm going to do, and I know it's more of a dynamic conversation, but of course, when we talk about statistics, it's not as fun just saying it. So I created a couple slides um, just so we can get some visuals. Um, so my name is Nolana Neubauer, um, and I hold two different hats. Um, so I work part-time as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Waterloo. And more recently, I've been working full-time as an occupational therapist at Lacombe Hospital and Care Centre, as well as Bentley Care Centre in Alberta, so a rural OT, um, where I'm responsible for more than 90 residents, um, and many of them have dementia. And I also work in acute care at our little hospital. So I've been getting a good taste of the front lines while also having a lot of experience in research. So for me, what got me involved in this area, so it really started back in 2015, I was doing my PhD in rehab science at the University of Alberta. And back then, uh, Dr. Lily Liu, she was the chair of the Department of Occupational Therapy. And it was 2016 where they had the Locating Technology Forum run through the Finding Way program, um, and it was held in Toronto. And I actually had the chance to meet Ron Bellino and many other familiar faces for the first time. And it really allowed me to really see the big issues that came with loss and missing older adults and persons with dementia. And I immediately grasped on and fell in love with the area and just these number of gaps. And so it actually turned into my doctoral thesis um, where I completed in 2019. And for those researchers that are on the call, well, we always start off with a question. We all know this, we're hoping to answer it. And rather than having an answer, we come up with a million other different questions. And that essentially has turned into the aging and innovation research program at the University of Waterloo, where Lily is the Dean of the Faculty of Health. And so it was amazing just to see the work that I did during my doctorate really transfer into many, many different projects that we're a part of. Um, these are some of the key people that are associated with our team, and again, this is a small fraction of our entire team, but we have a wide array of expertise from occupational therapists to engineers to even those that have expertise on the front lines working with Alzheimer's society, so it's an amazing group to be a part of. So to bring it into the statistics and what really brings us all in here today. So we're all here. So we all know that we're dealing with an aging population and many individuals alongside this are going to be diagnosed with dementia. And so now imagine how many people are being diagnosed with dementia. And I'll see that six out of 10 people with dementia will wander. I will briefly bring that up in a couple slides from now, but approximately 60% of individuals with dementia will go missing at least once. And if they go missing the first time, they do have a higher risk of going, getting lost and going missing again. When we look at this missing persons cases at one point involving someone living with dementia, an older adult was a very small percentage, about 5%. But now over the years, we're now dealing with upwards to 50% of missing persons calls are now dealing with this population. And we know that it's only going to continue to increase. And there's a huge urgency that would comes with a specific missing population, just because if they're not found within 24 hours, it is estimated that upwards to 50% will be found seriously injured or deceased. And this is an American statistic. Now, if we take it more so from the concepts within Canada, we all know that we have a very unforgiving weather. Um, where I am in Alberta, and I know it's similar in other parts of the province, it can be minus 30 degrees one day, and it can be plus 30 degrees the next day. So this 24-hour span, for us, it could be a matter of minutes to be able to try to find them as soon as possible. To be able to further add to the complexity of this, they're an incredibly challenging population for police to try to find as soon as possible. They always use the philosophy among search and rescue officers that they go until they get stuck. You find them in places that many other missing persons won't be found, such as inside, inside of hedges. You'll find them near bodies of water. And so while they're 95% are found within a quarter of a mile, again, it's incredibly hard to find them just because there's extra challenges. So the big question, where do most people go missing from? Well, we would all assume that they all go missing from the home or in the community. But what little of us might know is that 20% are actually, they get lost and go missing from care facilities. And very well, some of these that are deemed as locked dementia units or were meant for wandering facilities, 20% of them actually go missing from some of these. 11% go missing from hospitals, 8% from streets, just so if they're out for a walk and they forget where they are to 3% being from open spaces and 11% being from others, such as if they're at a coffee shop or if they're out and about in their community. 
And so really missing older adults and missing persons with dementia truly is a public health safety and community issue. The burden is large. Um, it impacts so many different people and I know it's touched every single life. When we look at how the impact is, it not only impacts the person with dementia and their care partners, but it impacts the communities that the person's a part of. It impacts search and rescue personnel, it impacts clinicians, facilities, governments even. And so this is becoming a growing issue. The costs are going to increase. How do we keep them safe? And the key thing we, I wanna be able to highlight and that we're gonna be able to share in this discussion today is that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and there are in fact ways to intervene. And you'll learn about some of these. And then just to touch up before I pass it off to Ron, this whole concept of wandering um, over the last seven years that have been involved in this area, it's quite a heated discussion depending on what country or what person you talk to. Um, so there's this assumption that wandering is aimless. And I think they get this from the original Algae's definition where we assume wandering is those that pace and lap in long-term care facilities. So I've seen lots of that at the two sites I'm in. But wandering is so much more than this aimless activity. Many of them like to walk with a purpose. Some of them end up going out and about in their community and they forget where they are. Even ourselves, um, imagine that we like to go for a wander out in our communities, out in local parks. We like to go for hikes. That can also be deemed as quote unquote wandering. Um, and persons with dementia aren't always aware that they're lost. What might seem like hours to us might almost, see, almost seem just a few minutes to them. So we need to be aware of that. And the key piece is just because there's such a negative piece that comes with wandering, we've almost always tried to restrict the behavior entirely. But wandering is so important in so many different ways. It allows us to engage in our community. For those that are further on in their journey and they're no longer verbal, it's a way of being able to convey if they have unmet needs. There's so many different positive pieces of wandering that really, and we'll bring this up throughout this conversation, is that we want to allow someone with dementia to wander, but to be able to do so safely. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna pass it off to Ron to introduce himself. Hey everyone, uh, Dorina, were you gonna introduce me? I wasn't sure there. It's all good. I, I think you're someone that as an age old champion needs no introduction. I think most of the folks on this uh, webinar are likely know who you are, but just in case they don't, please go ahead. Okay, thanks, Eric. I didn't really have an introduction for myself, but greetings, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us, and also some of you that's uh, joining us outside of Canada. I think I saw someone from New York, so uh, kudos to you for joining us. Uh, this is not a challenge that it's just local in one area. This is worldwide, as Nolan has said, so um, I'm going to share my thoughts. The beauty with uh, presenting with Nolana is that uh, she does all the hard work for me. She does all the data and all that stuff. I just am the storyteller of examples uh, and how that relates to real life. So uh, I think we have a good team here. I think this is like the fifth or sixth time uh, we presented together uh, with Alzheimer's societies as well. But I'll give you some of my thoughts here today. Uh, and I should, you guys should be seeing me full screen, hopefully, everybody. Otherwise, this would be really tiny. If, uh, but You're good, Ron. I'm good. Yeah, thank you. So uh, that's our topic here. A little introduction. Production, okay, a family here. That is me, okay. You got dad and mom, you got me together, okay. And there is a cat in this story here. That's lucky. You always have to throw in a cat in, the, in any presentation, and everybody will love that there. So, so that's lucky part of the care team. But my work in this space, as Nolana has shared, uh, started back in, I think, 2015, 2016. And uh, thank you to AgeWell uh, and the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario that got us together uh, to do a presentation. Uh, it's a Finding Your Way program. And uh, back then we, I came and brought four other caregivers to tell their story. And there were kind of, uh, some of those stories aren't quite light. You know, there's stories that have had family members that have passed away and even some that are still missing to this day. So that is the amount of work that we're doing. It's not, a, and it's something that, people don't realize how this creeps up on you if you are dealing with this challenge. So that was back then. Um, since then, I think Alzheimer's Society Durham is here today. So shout out to all of you. I'm surprised, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, that was a talk I did there. Uh, and uh, it's allowed me to present uh, at many other societies across Canada. Uh, you'll also quietly see, I'm just gonna zoom in just for fun here. For those in the age well community, you might know who this gentleman is. Uh, that's Roger Marple. So he was uh, actually also a, a profile. He does a lot of work around uh, advoc advocacy related to dementia and uh, stigma. So that's Roger there. Uh, since then, I've been presenting to police services 
um, not just here in Canada, uh, but also Australia and other parts of the world, uh, from not just simply telling the story, but the strategies. Uh, from my perspective, from the learnings I get from Nolana and others, uh, so we've got to kind of share that work. Uh, a few years ago, AgeWell um, and uh, also Cabby supported um, some, some work done on an alert system that uh, we've been working on, and it's still being worked on community ASAP. Uh, coming from the innovator side, you kind of learn how challenging it is to bring something to fruition, but um, here you'll see some of the work we did with search and rescue teams. Okay, that was over in BC, so we were testing out the alert system back then. Um, and also uh, coming back here in Toronto, where I'm at, uh, we get, we've done some work with police services, that's Toronto Police over there, uh, community partners. And uh, even to this point right now, we're actually uh, at the stage with a rapid response team here in Ontario. Uh, that's a little bit of an outdated photo, but uh, the rapid response team focuses on uh, educating first responders. So that's police, fire, and EMS related to some of these challenges. So there's a lot of work being done. Oh, I got to focus also on this gentleman here. That's Paul Lee. So he is well known in the age well community as a voice of a advocate living with dementia as well. And Paul has his own stories as well. Okay, so that is a little background of who I am, uh, an introduction. Um, and then con continuing here, I just wanted to share a little bit of the challenges. So I'll use my story as an example. So that's dad. And you could see he was diagnosed back in 2007, passed away 2018. And the first challenge that I had when I realized how difficult dementia might be for our story was actually when he started going missing. He would actually go to the store. Uh, for those uh, that might know Toronto, I'm just saying in Scarborough, uh, they're on a busy street called Eglinton. Okay, So it's a three-way street on both sides. Okay, And that's in Scarborough. A very uh, dangerous area if you're not walking properly, if you're not paying attention. So he would go to the plaza. And uh, it took about two to three years that we realized sometimes he was coming home late. So I didn't live with my parents, but I would get calls from mom saying, hey, your dad's not home yet. It's like 30 minutes later, it's getting darker. And then eventually he actually uh, went missing you know, completely and we needed to call the police. So that was back, I think, after like six years of this. And then he was found like an hour away. So that is something that we had to figure out. And I realized we were lucky we actually found him. So that's kind of the challenge that we're dealing with. And there's a bunch of challenges you're going to see here listed that I have. Um, so challenges is important, but I'm also going to say this one around wandering. So my view around the words about wandering versus getting lost. So I, I want to chime in on this. Uh, Sir, hang in there. So words do matter, but for me, it's one of those things that we got to move past because the intent is whether I use wandering, whether I use getting lost, the, the whole point is we're in danger or there's something that's at risk. So it's not the words that I want to focus on. So this happens in other words in this space, caregiver versus care partner versus carer versus informal caregivers, you know, versus son, daughter. Okay, so that's an that's example I use that some people understand the word caregiver. Someone might say, no, I'm a care partner. Honestly, words matter for me, but in the end, we got to move past that. Okay, so that's just something I wanted us to kind of uh, address there. Okay, and very briefly, I'm just going to share, if I can, a little video just so you can have an idea of who dad is here. So share on screen three. I kind of lost the video there. So that is dad. Can you hear this? Yeah. Well, we did. Uh, so that was his day program. Very good, right? In Scarborough. And it's about making sure that they very go out nice. and that they have that quality of life, that they're not just stuck at home. That is the goal. And uh, that is just something I wanted to share there for a little bit of who dad is okay and i think i will pause there for now great thank you ron for that uh, introduction and uh you can see uh both of our speakers are passionate and connected to this uh topic so we want to hear from the audience now quickly with our first uh poll 
Uh, we want to know what role best describes you. So you can check uh, more than one role, I believe. Uh, so are you an older adult, a caregiver, a researcher, a trainee, community partner, industry partner, or other? And if you're clicking on that other, feel free to throw in the chat um, what, what kind of your main role might be uh, or what brings you here today. Uh, so great to see lots of uh, community partners in the audience, uh, researchers, caregivers, older adults, uh, train, like all, all, we've got folks in all the categories. Um, and so, and I see folks typing in the chat, we've got some PTs and OTs in the audience as well and uh, educators. So that's really uh, exciting. Um, as we let folks, yeah, perfect. So you can see those results there. So we're gonna move uh, on to now uh, our second question uh, for our two speakers. Uh, which is to really, and I think Ron, you kind of started to do this a little bit, is really to walk uh, the audience through some examples of how a person might find themselves uh, getting lost or wandering. Uh, and so give us just some examples of, uh, of you know, those, the, those, those, maybe those first uh, six years or onwards as you were starting to talk about. Yeah, so the, some of these examples are not just mine. There's like other people that were part of this uh, that I got these stories from, and uh, it's uh, it's quite unique. Uh, so I'm going to share here. Where am I here? Okay, so some examples of incidents. So I'm going to use the term incident. That is my word. Um, that's why I put the uh, asterisk there. Um, it's not necessarily just even getting lost. Okay, so an incident could be uh, that you're just confused. You're not actually lost. Um, so that's why I use the word incident. And it's also what degree is this? Okay, so you might assume that if someone is missing, they're lost, police are involved, that could be, you know, a big incident. But it's the little ones that I want people to be aware of because they start adding up. And it's one of those, as I said, if my dad was missing or didn't come home for five minutes, okay, and he was just confused and he went a different way, uh, then he found himself to get back. I count that as an incident that for some reason he uh, had a moment of confusion and that moment could have multiplied easily. Okay? And that's how many of these happen. So here's a list. Okay. And that this list is uh, just a few. Now it's small, but that's okay. I'm going to read these out there. Okay. So, so the silent exit. So the incident when someone actually just quietly leaves home. Okay, the door opens and no one even knows that that person has left. That's the silent exit. That's considered an incident. That could happen. The worst ones would be in the middle of the night when it's winter. Okay, and there have been families that uh, would wake up and sadly their loved one is actually found just outside the door. Okay, passed away. Okay, um, but that silent exit could be something as simple as someone opening up the doors in the house, trying to find, maybe they were just looking for the bathroom. Okay, so those are signs where you're kind of looking uh, and observing and saying, okay, my dad keeps opening up the cupboards or keeps peeking into a room. Why is he doing that? Okay, those to me are incidences that, you know, actually are the small ones that lead up to the dangerous one. So that's one, walking outdoors. Let me uh, actually, actually I'm gonna cover myself up in here. So walking outdoors and not knowing where dad is going. Okay, so that's a common one. So uh, people think that you're just left, lost out and about. And as Nolana said, uh, do we wanna restrict them from going out? Uh, that was usually the, you know, that's how many families do it. They would try and lock the doors. They would say, dad, don't go out, stay home. You shouldn't be out there. And it could be a beautiful day. No, it's about going outdoors, but he may be confused of where he is uh, and finding his way back. Uh, opening up doors. I gave that example to rooms and cupboards constantly uh, searching. Uh, so these are also signs. Okay. So in the dementia space, we kind of use the term behaviors. But, uh, you know, there's some debate also on that word, uh, you know, sort of what kind of behavior it is. Um, so my dad might simply be looking for something or he needs to, to get something uh, or he wants something and he can't find it. So he's just opening the door and trying to go out and maybe look for that. Okay, so that could be a, a, an example. Uh, peeking outside. So again, here's another one. Peeking outside the window. Those were signs that I figured out. And I know a lot of families started realizing when people are like peeking out, like they feel like they need to be somewhere or go somewhere, but the concept of time, 
uh, the concept of uh, knowing uh, the weather outside or even that there's nothing that they're supposed to go to at that time uh, could be a signal. Okay, That to me are tiny little incidences that can add up. Uh, at the mall restaurant, a party. My dad got lost at the casino at, uh, with the family. This was very early on when he was just early diagnosed. And uh, out of all places, this is a casino in Las Vegas. Uh, the Filipino family, all of us were having a buffet. <laughs> and he went to the bathroom and then we realized half an hour later, he hasn't come back and it took us two hours to find him. But he, we were lucky he was still in the casino. If he made it outside, that would have been quite scary. Um, happens at the mall. People at the mall, sometimes uh, couples, uh, I know those stories where they would go, a husband and wife, and then suddenly, let's just say it's the husband, let's say my dad and mom are there, and then suddenly my dad would um, step away for a second, and then he actually goes home by himself, forgets that his wife's there, okay, so she's running around looking for him. Uh, that's an example. Traveling on a trip, there have been people that have traveled and done their best, but they would go on a trip together. And if you're not paying attention, depending how far along uh, someone might be uh, with their awareness of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so they would actually maybe go on the wrong bus. So the worst one I've heard was actually a caregiver with, uh, I think it was her husband, uh, somewhere in LA, and the husband actually went on a different plane. She went to the bathroom and he somehow made it on the plane and they found him in another uh, state. So that was a scary one. Uh, and then in your own home. So a lot of people uh, has shared, even in my own building, I'm staring at my, my uh, door and that's not my door. Okay? That's not where I'm supposed to be, but I'm confused where I'm supposed to be. So that could happen. Um, I said, oh yeah, when, when people are sleeping, that's the one I'm concerned about. The silent exit, people get lost driving. That's another common one. Uh, sometimes uh, I've had people tell me that they ended up on a one-way street and they were so confused. So that's why driving in dementia is a challenge as well. And my last comment on this is that it does creep up on you and uh, caregivers need to be attentive. So that's uh, some examples there. Great, thank you, Ron. Uh, so, I think maybe, I'm not sure if you wanted to share uh, the video as well oh. uh, at this point. Yeah, so I'll give you one example of my dad about to leave uh, the house. Okay, and um, here is the one where he's about to leave home. Now, I, this was back maybe about eight years ago and I was using remote technology at that stage. So I had a sensor there, I had a camera. Uh, very different now today, but back then, this is a video that gets a lot of attention pre-pandemic saying, how are you doing video or remote communication with your dad? Well, this was Skype. Um, so, uh, so here's an example of that there. Okay. So that's him. I happen to be at home and he, I have a monitor, video monitor that I could watch him. And that's him about to leave when he shouldn't be leaving. And my mom's actually not at work. Hi, Dad. Hi, Dad. How are you? How are you? I'm over here. I'll come in here. Come here. You just relax, okay? Okay. You stay home, okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, here. Just, uh, it's not. I can't know. Okay, but you have to stay there, okay, Dad? Okay. Okay, you just relax. Yeah, okay. Okay, how's Lucky? Uh, how's Lucky? Lucky? Yeah, where's Lucky? You want Lucky? Yeah. Lucky is upstairs. Okay, who's that right there on the floor? Okay. That's lucky. Oh, it's the brother of lucky. So that was a video where you got to see lucky, the, the cat actually support dad. And actually lucky spends time with my dad for about another 20 minutes and he forgot about me that I was actually there. So uh, that was an example that uh, helped us uh, where lucky can, was part of our care team. So that's just one example of how easily it could be, okay? Now, that's where uh, we'll talk a little bit more later about some tools and technologies there. 
Uh, Thank you, Ron. I, I love, I love, it's been, I think a long time since I've, <laughs> I've seen that video and I always love seeing, seeing Lucky and, and your dad interact. It's just, it's a, it's a special bond that we have with our, with our animal family members. Um, I want to go back to Noelana now and ask you, what does wandering behavior look like? Uh, you know, we've heard so many examples um, kind of from your, you know, clinical perspective, what happens once an individual is lost and, uh, and what about the broader kind of policy implications of that happening? Thanks. So um, to be able to give, and I know Ron gave some excellent examples, and I figured I'd give a couple more just in terms of advanced and early dementia, and then I'm probably going to just pose a couple key problems because that's really going to lead into some of the solutions that both Ron and I will be talking about. Um, so advanced dementia, um, and I've been seeing this um, quite often in some of the long-term care facilities I'm at, and you might also see it in the community, but when they're further on in their journey, and many times they don't necessarily know where they are, I'm sure many of those on the line, it's, they end up hearing that it's, they don't see this as their home or they think that they're going to work. And so that's where they might end up heading off to. Um, they might be going to school. Um, and then even as I mentioned, wanting to be a way of them just being able to communicate their needs. So let's say I have no idea where the bathroom is and I can't find the signs to the toilet. And so in many ways, I'm just trying to find where the toilet is. And all of a sudden out I go and I'm lost. Um, or I'm trying to find food. Um, when we're looking at earlier dementia, um, and again, I already alluded to this, that we have wandering without an end destination. So you're going for a stroll in the park and then all of a sudden you have no idea where you are. And I know a perfect example of that is from that movie, Still Alice, where she's up for a jog and all of a sudden cannot recognize what is around her. Um, walking with a target in mind, um, in many ways, they might just get lost and they're out and about in the community. Um, and they, and as Ron had mentioned, and I know this came from one of our beloved um, individuals living with dementia, that it's, he was, he went grocery shopping, he was right in front of his apartment door, had the keys in his hand, and all of a sudden had no idea where he was. And it took him two and two to be able to realize that the key had to go in the door because that's where his apartment was. And so in that in itself, he was lost um, over the span of a period of time. Um, but when they actually get out of the building, out of their home, um, some of the challenges that we see um, within long-term care facilities, and even speaking to some in Alberta, is they'll have a fence outside. And they say, oh, well, there's a fence, it will stop them from going out. Well, it's a, there's a fence, but many individuals with dementia, they're able to climb up and get over, like many of us are able to. Um, sometimes they get lost or they quote unquote elope from their facility because there's limited entrances. The number of long-term care facilities I've seen where they just follow the direction and it takes them directly to that exit door, it's, it's just screaming that, yes, it's, it's you're going out and about. Um, with community and long-term care, when the individual is lost, when you don't know where they are, and now they're being reported as missing, um, from a clinical perspective, um, I know, and even from care partners, there's lots of problems of fears of litigation. There's problems that if they go out, that is our fault, something's going to happen, they're going to get taken away from me as a care partner, or I'm going to get my wrist slapped and something's going to happen to my license as an OT. I know that there's lots of fears that come with that act of being lost, that I didn't do enough, I'm going to get in trouble. And the problem that leads to this is many people are actually waiting beyond that 24 hours. They're almost trying to do their own search parties, if you will, of trying to find that person. And the big problem that comes with that is there's a significant delay that comes with to the police. Many police officers I've spoken to, they noted that they just want to get the call right away. Even if you find them and the police haven't gotten there um, right away, they just want to be able to get that call just because they want to be able to respond as soon as possible. Because in fact, it is on the top of their list. When they get a missing call and involve someone with dementia, it's immediately a priority one and they immediately will spend, send police officers to dispatch them. And they've emphasized over and over again to my colleagues and the others that have spoken to them that essentially it's, it's not bothering them. They just want to be there. Um, and when we look at when it actually gets to the police and they've gotten the call and they're now lost and there's, they're missing, there's quite a few gaps that our team has seen that, again, we're trying to address. And Ron alluded to the rapid response working group that we've done um, with the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario. We have come to learn there is a huge gap in terms of limited education um, for first responders, um, so not just police, but also fire as well as EMS. When it comes to just how do we address when someone's missing, um, what do we do to try to bring them home safely? Um, there's been some stories that they've been handcuffed just because they didn't know how to approach someone with dementia. 
There's also limited education. While the police are out looking for them, it's the communities don't know what to do. Um, when we look at a missing child and a child is sitting by themselves in the community, we know something's going on. But I've heard so many cases of an older adult that's been out and about in the community and is missing, but they'd be mistaken if they're disheveled as just someone that is homeless. And so really there's gaps in education when it comes to how do we identify if a person with dementia or an older adult is in fact missing? Um, how do we learn of that? Um, community involvement, there's always big questions. How do we let other know, uh, other individuals know in the community that the person is missing? There's still a stigma with dementia. So how do we let the community know they're missing without advertising that they're dementia? And another key thing that I'll lead into our next discussion um, is there also is that big problem, and Ron has alluded to this, on that fine balance between safety and being able to have that sense of autonomy. Um, I know myself as a clinician um, is that we're, we just want to keep people as safe as possible, but at what cost will that have? Great, they are in a locked dementia facility, they're going to be safe as possible, but guess what, they just lost their ability to go outside and to be able to enjoy things that were meaningful to them. So this is a really big challenge that some of these solutions and strategies will talk about will help to address it. Great. Thank you, Nolana. I'm going to engage our audience. I believe this is our last poll, but we do have some more questions for you as well. And so um, I think, you know, we, we've got a captivating, a captivated audience here of uh, close to 70 folk of 70 people. Um, and so the, the question we want to ask is why are you interested in today's topic? Um, are you a person with lived experience of dementia, a caregiver uh, or care partner of someone living with dementia? Uh, perhaps you're generally interested in the topic or you have an, uh, another reason for being here today and feel free to let us know, um, you know why, why you joined today. Maybe you're, you're, you're planning ahead or you're thinking about how this might impact you in your personal life um, uh, or your researcher in this topic, whatever it is, uh, we're, we're happy to, to hear from you. And so let's, I feel like we've identified the terminology, we've identified a lot of different scenarios of how this might um, happen. I, 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 you know, I've learned a lot, even though I've <laughs> heard you present before and I know this topic well. And so I'm, I'm really excited to get to the next piece, which is really, what are some of the solutions when we think about policies, when we think about practices, um, you know, in like long-term care settings or, or elsewhere, you know, from any, anywhere from the low-tech solutions to the high-tech solutions. And I'll, I'll start with uh, Noelana again. Thanks, Serena. So I will start off with the high and the low tech, and then I'll move on to just some of the policy pieces. Um, so for high tech, and I know I've been seeing this in the in the chat box already. Um, so locating devices is always one of the biggest things that come to mind, um, whether it's GPS. Um, and I know Ron will share a couple of good examples of there being apps that are available on our phones. Apple watches are having that. So there's lots and there's a huge role to play when it comes to locating devices. But even when I've spoken to others in the community, um, basic things like home alarm systems, you know, it's as if you open the door, I remember my grandparents had this, I opened the door and it announced that the door was open. I know that was a strategy that some people use. It's a little more high tech, but not quite high tech because it's already embedded in some of our homes. Um, but something I also want to be able to bring up is some of those low tech that are things that we also need to look into, um, such as signs to help with wayfinding. A lot of ways they just get lost because they don't know where certain things are. And so how do we help to ensure that they know where the toilet is, where certain things are, so it helps guide them along the way. Um, another key piece that's very much low tech is just meeting unmet needs. It might seem as simple as it is, but essentially it's many individuals are bored. They're lonely. They, have, they lack some of these meaningful activities. So if you're able to address some of these unmet needs in many ways, at least within long-term care facilities, it really helps sat satisfy them in terms of what they're trying to look for. And then as well, I know there's for low tech, there's identification measures. So you can have something as simple as having a card. You can put labels and clothing, medical alert bracelets and other identification bracelets are also something that is common. And something that I have emphasized, um, and it's also part of the Canadian guideline for safe wandering, that was a piece of my doctoral thesis and is now being turned into a vir virtual version, where essentially you highlight that one size does not fit all. Um, just because you have a locator device doesn't mean that it's gonna fit for everyone else. And just because they have it, what happens if they forget to wear it? What happens if they forget to charge it? Um, so really the important piece is just to be able to have as many strategies in your tool belt as possible, because if one fails, it's always good to have another one there. 
Um, for those that are more so in facilities and within healthcare environments, environmental is huge. Um, same thing when it looks at communities. So the building layout, it is so helpful for us to be able to guide our way. I, even myself in a hospital, I have no idea where I'm going. So imagine someone living with dementia. Um, dementia friendly communities, I know that it's starting to become a topic that they're including in this, just how do we assist with navigation through public transportation, how do we help them with signs throughout the community just so they know where to go because that can potentially um, reduce their chance of getting lost. Now when we bring up some of the policy pieces, um, when we talk about all these amazing, amazing strategies, it always comes down to funding and I know that that's a huge question that's going to take a long time for us to be able to figure out. But who pays for what? Um, some GPS devices are amazing, but they're very expensive. Um, and we know that some people don't necessarily have that money to afford these devices. Same thing with urban versus rural communities. It's, I know some of the very rural communities where it's hard to get access to reception. So great, how do we get some of that funded and how do we get some supports for that? And for some particular strategies, it relies on you having a care partner. Well, there's a growing number of individuals living with dementia that are living on their own. So how do we ensure that funding and appropriate resources are available to them? Another key piece for policy is who should be held responsible for addressing the issue. Should it come from just the person with dementia? Should it come from the family? Should it come from the community? Or should it come from the government? Or really, should it come from all four? And I know from the work that our team has done, really, it takes an entire community, it takes our governments to be able to work together to address this issue. It's, it's all of our problem at the end of the day. Um, and really, the types of programs is a key piece. And I know I've seen amazing work that's gone on in the last seven years um, from an increase in public education, such as the Finding a Way program, other Alzheimer's societies and dementia-friendly communities are doing an awesome job with just creating toolkits in different ways of being able to educate those in the public as well as families. Training first responders, that's actually a huge project that's a part of um, work that our team is doing at U Waterloo, where we're trying to be able to come up with some of these different pieces and be able to dispel it across the country so more first responders are educated. And I know the Rapid Response Initiative is the key, 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 key piece to that. And another one I know that is a huge hot topic is just on alert systems, the need for a type of silver alert. And so can governments be involved in this particular policy where if they're missing and we have nothing, they don't have any strategies involved, how can we find them as soon as possible? And alert systems could potentially be a piece to that. Thank you. Yes. And I've been, as, as our policy person at AgeWell, I've been watching that very closely, the missing persons legislation and seeing some provinces add, you know, a silver alert amendment to allow for, you know, better, better really taking, allowing police officers to take action quicker so that they can find individuals. So I'm seeing a, a question in the chat from Kim, and I think Ron is about to answer it. Uh, what high tech devices um, uh, and, and apps uh, in terms of locating devices are out there. Uh, so take it away, Ron. Uh, yes, yeah, so that answer is not an easy one there, Kim. <laughs> uh, and Nolana knows this, it would be uh, a very, so, so I'll explain how to go looking for some of them, what are some features, but it isn't something that is easy to uh, explain. So for example, uh, I'm kind of going off topic at what my notes here, but I'm just gonna pull up the GPS devices that I'm holding on right now. Okay, so I've just have three GPS devices. This was the first one my dad had back in I think 2010, 2011, and there's like a button on it. Okay, so I support all tools and technologies that are out there. Okay, as long as it reduces the chances of failure of us having something bad happen, and it increases the chances of success. But as Nolana said, there is no one perfect solution. Um, just like uh, there's no one perfect uh, spaghetti dish that you're going to like, like whatever that um, poor example, but I'm just trying to say that that's the challenge we have. So it is one where you're going to have to do a little bit of a trial and error, see the reviews of what's out there. Um, I am going to share a couple um, innovators with age well in a second here, but I'm just going to let you know this one was the first one and within two or three months, we had to drop this. Okay, uh, I had to get another one and I couldn't return it back then. Uh, I already it was already past its warranty. Um, and I always tell people you got to try technology and check the warranty so you can return it if you don't like it. But it was working well for us for maybe about three, four months. I can't recall exactly. And then my dad just started kept pressing the, you know, the emergency button here. And for our situation, we couldn't turn it off. There was really no feature at that time for this uh, solution. So I said, 
this isn't helping me because I'm always rushing over to check up on my dad. And he's just sitting on the couch watching TV, pressing this button, thinking it's a remote control. So that didn't work out. So I got another one. Okay. So this one didn't have a button. Okay. But we actually got two of these because it was it actually worked out that this was cheaper per month uh, versus this other one that was $30 a month. This was $15. So we could get two of these and we would have a backup. So my dad would, for us, luckily for him, put it on a keychain. Okay, and he would always leave the house with his keys. Well, we had two sets of keys for him, one that we kept in his jacket and one that he would grab. And that actually helped us in those moments where uh, um, we forgot to charge it or my mom didn't charge it properly or something like that. So that's kind of important. But here we go with regards to uh, just some solutions and strategies. As Nolana said, high tech and low tech. Okay, I'm not gonna go into high detail of what these all mean. Uh, for those that understand the differences, but there's GPS where you usually have to pay a monthly service, okay? So GPS can work with these devices as I showed you, or there's also GPS on the phone, okay? So if someone already has a smartphone, you could utilize that smartphone for tracking. There's free apps uh, on the uh, Google has theirs, the Google locate features uh, app there. There's uh, Apple has the find my app. So there's the standard ones and there's a few that, um, have a lot more features that also help collect data. So that's that there. There's Bluetooth, there's radio frequency. So I saw Marjorie, you talked about Project Lifesaver. Okay, that is a program that usually is with the community and police services. Uh, you could look up Project Lifesaver, um, but it's not everywhere. Uh, and they use um, more of a radio frequency uh, technology. It's kind of like those ones that go beep, 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 the closer you get the stronger the signal is, okay? Um, so there's some pros and cons to that. Uh, there's cameras and sensors. I was using, as you saw, a camera back in like 2012, 2013. Uh, it's come a long way. There's these other cameras and sensors, okay? Some of them are age old, so I'm gonna get into this shot here, okay? That I'll show, so this is AltonView, uh, cameras and sensors that you could have. Uh, low tech, as Nolana said, signs, post-it notes, uh, signs we had, dad stay at home, we would have, uh, some people go into the more dangerous stuff where there's locks, okay? They would lock the door on the inside or they would even disguise the door or put something in the way. Um, so there are some dangers with that. Uh, so there could be fire hazards, okay? So sadly, uh, there was a niece back, I think it was somewhere in Europe uh, and she actually, for her aunt said, you know, auntie, please stay at home, do not leave the house, okay? Just so happened that that building had a fire and she didn't leave. She stayed there and sadly she perished. So the best intent sometimes doesn't get the best solution, but that's the challenge here. Uh, community. So the other piece that's important to me is the community. So bringing in community, this is not a one person solution. Okay, so I brought the community from the neighbors, also the coffee shop at my dad's uh, community area where he would go to the, uh, the restaurants. I would tell them and give them my business card and say, hey, my dad's here and it's past 6 p.m. Do me a favor, give me a call, please, because he really shouldn't be out by that, that time, okay? So that's an example. Uh, just the male person that's traveling around there, okay? So those are some examples you could think of. Uh, there's media uh, that will be used, of course, uh, the news if it gets really serious, um, but they can't always be posting the missing incidents every day. There's in, here in Toronto, there's easily six to a dozen people missing at this moment or during the day. You're not gonna get that on the news every day. Right, so that's that's called alert fatigue. So that's a concern as well, too much alerts. Uh, but there are families that are stressing right now and even police searching for people. Uh, then there's social media that comes out there. I'm suggesting we go for a proactive approach, okay, that we gotta be a little bit more proactive. A lot of the solutions are reactive, we need both. Um, and as I said, backup systems. So if that camera didn't work and I didn't catch my dad leaving his house, I would have a neighbor I could call right away and I say, my dad's not there, can you, check around before I get there. Um, I would have a GPS on him. That's backup number three. I would have two GPS on him. That's backup number four. I have the coffee shop. You know, that's backup number five, number six. So that's an example of what we need to do uh, to make sure my dad still can go out and be safe. So, and then the last thing, and Nolana, you did address up, uh, you know, hinted to this area that we also got to be careful here. Okay, there's privacy issues depending, you know, on some people say, I don't want to be tracked, okay? Um, there is the freedoms, okay, so the freedom of not just their freedom of going around, uh, but you also have to look at 
the freedom to choose to live with risk, okay? We're always focusing priority safety, and I get that, okay? But there is that freedom of risk for some of us that you should be allowed to live with risk, but where's that line? So that's another conversation. And then ethical concerns, you know, some people actually hide the GPS, okay, without telling someone, okay? And that happened with a family, and then eventually they found out that, uh, dad actually was uh, with his mistress, right? Now, the thing is, um, you know, that could be a kind of a funny story, you could say, but technically, um, yeah, it's one of those, there is no law against that technically. So that's an example, right? That, that uh, he got very upset with that. So those are just a few examples and finish it off. And I know we could go hours on this here, but here's just a few examples. Full disclosure, I actually collaborate with these two companies uh, since they came through AgeWell. Um, and um, there's been a few listed uh, here also in the chat, I believe. Um, I'm trying to remember who else was listed here. Oh, yeah, Safe Tracks is another one out of Alberta. Great company to take a look at Safe Tracks, uh, gps.ca. This one is Altum View, and they're the ones that have these sensors in the house that actually, I'll zoom in here. Uh, convert someone into a stick figure, okay? So instead of that camera that I had back then, it will convert them into a stick figure. That way my mom could be, sorry, my mom could be comfortable that she's doesn't have to be fully dressed um, or, you know, that I might see her or someone might see her not proper. Um, so that's Altum View addressing the privacy. And then there's WeTrack, which is someone asked, what app? This is a Canadian company that I'm a fan of because uh, the innovator here, Ishan, uh, by himself, has actually made this a class one medical and software device. I'm screwing that up, but software as a medical device. So the hope one day is like that policy stuff that Milana was saying is that uh, instead of a doctor saying, here, Ron, I'm going to give your dad a pharmacological solution. Here's the pill to knock him out. And so he doesn't go out. I'm going to prescribe you a, uh, a technology, an age tech tool, so you can keep them safe. So that's just a few examples of where things are going moving forward. Okay. Great. Thank you, Ron. And I want to make sure uh, I keep us on time. And so uh, those are excellent solutions. And I see there's some questions in the chat. And so thank you, Noelana, for kind of answering those as we're going along. Um, if, if folks are comfortable sharing uh, their stories in the chat, feel free to do so. I think I've seen some folks uh, share a little bit. So have you ever experienced someone getting lost? Um, yes, no, you can just answer or you can choose us to share as much as you're comfortable with. Um, we're going to go into the Q&A uh, period now. And I think we've, we've answered some questions in the chat already, I know, but um, Noelana, there's one for you in the Q&A, just talking about, um, maybe you could comment a little bit on supporting um, uh, folks experiencing del delusion uh, type behaviors. So I'm not exactly sure um, how exactly to answer this question on delusional type of behaviors. I would say the best um, to be able to speak to would probably just be at your local Alzheimer's society, or even if you have contact into either an OT or another health professional that has expertise in that, they are amazing. They're very, very knowledgeable to be able to help answer some of your questions. Great. And I'm going to uh, allow folks to kind of um, ask questions as we go through. So I'll, I'll, I'll look, I'll keep my eye on the Q&A and the chat, but just for the sake of time, um, I want to ask our uh, speakers, what is one thing you hope to see in this sector in the future? So let's say by, by 2030 or 2040, kind of, you know, think eight, 10 plus years from now, uh, how do you want the space to look like? And Nolana, let's start with you. No, no, you give one, one hope. And then my problem is I can't just choose one hope because there's so many things. Um, but just for a couple um, is one of the biggest things I know that's missing um, is we need a more consistent approach to data collection of missing persons cases involving this population. Really, we need this because we need models to further predict the risks of getting lost. We generally know what puts someone at, at, at risk of getting lost, but we need more data to help inform that. And again, one of the problems I'd propose is that we need more, more, more advocacy for funding. Well, we need data to be able to show how effective some of these strategies are so we can go to our governments to be able to get further funding. 
Um, and another key piece um, is, and again, Ron and I have brought this um, throughout this present throughout this talk is that we need to see more of a proactive approach versus a reactive approach. Too often we've been waiting to see for people to go missing the first time and sometimes the first time they're lost is the last time they're ever found. So how do we be as proactive as possible? I'd love that to be standard practice to get a diagnosis with dementia and you're able to figure out what risk that person's at and to be able to get them to use some strategies right off the get go. So I'd say those are some of the biggest pieces and just really how do we change how wandering is managed? How do we just promote them to be able to have that sense of autonomy while still trying to keep them safe? I know it's a big challenge, but how do we figure that out? We're on to take those challenges, Nolana. That's, uh, I think, what the AgeWell community is leading in here in Canada yeah. with many others, that uh, the challenges are ramping up really fast and uh, we need to kind of, again, get ahead. we got to get upstream, okay, to use a river analogy, uh, then uh, dealing with all the stuff that's coming here, we got to clean it up a little bit ahead uh, upstream there. So for me, Doreen, I know whenever anyone asks one question, I'm always going to give three or four. I'm going to sneak in a little bit more. So uh, one of them for me, I'm going to say with regard to the technology side of things that that some of the technologies are not as obvious. They're a little bit more embedded for those that are willing to have the technology. Not everyone wants it. So I respect that. Uh, but for this group, the age tech group, uh, that they're kind of like naturally embedded, that could be in some like, let's say, adapted clothing, okay, you know, that it's a little bit not as clunky, right? As I said, I forgot to show, like, for example, I have Bluetooth devices, like the, the tile tracker, okay, that different technology, but uh, it's not a GPS and Apple has their own, okay, so there's the Apple Air, Air something, I forgot what it's called there. Someone will put that in there in the chat. But these are Bluetooth dev devices, which kind of can just simply help find things. It's a key finder. That's really what it is. Um, but they're getting smaller, but I, I would love that in, in clothing, you know, that that's in uh, something a little more adaptive clothing specifically is what I'm interested in. Then the other pieces within the community that I'm interested in is how people actually uh, help people get out a little bit more. It's not about the let's lock them up, let's get them out into the community a little bit more, which means we need more community programs and services and knowledge that, hey, that's okay, you know, create the environments, the wayfinding signages and all that stuff that just makes life easier that people can just continue living their life. So those are two that I'm very interested in that people get more proactive in this. And lastly is that people kind of pick up the signs earlier, okay? And they actually act on it. They don't wait until I have to call the police, okay? I could have, a lot of us already know these challenges. And when I say, okay, my dad keeps looking at the mirror, okay? Maybe we could take the mirror away because that's a trigger for him. Uh, that is something that you don't have to wait until you have those incidences. And you're not going to find that from your doctor. The doctor yeah. doesn't give you those answers. So those are my responses. Thank you, Ron. I think it's it's so nice that throughout the whole conversation, we've talked about low tech and high tech solutions. Um, in our chat, you'll see an evaluation survey. So please fill that out. It helps us plan our future programming. I want to invite all of you to our April 5th webinar, Balancing Work and Care Strategies for Meaningful Employment on National Caregiver Day. Uh, really excited to celebrate uh, with everyone. And there's, there's uh, some questions that we didn't manage to get to. There's one about uh, the research landscape on evaluating these devices and are they assessed in studies? And I'll just quickly say from my knowledge <laughs> at AgeWell, yes, they are, uh, but some are not, right? So some, are, some, some folks innovate, put out products um, and make a lot of claims. Uh, but then the, the, the evidence might not always be there. So you kind of have to do your due diligence as a consumer. And I know Nolana and her team are working on a list. Yeah. And so, you know, the, that list will definitely be, I think, vetted and, you know, evidence-based. And uh, so look out for that. Um, and I really want to end here with uh, someone in the chat, Julie, uh, said, you know, uh, really hoping to see that, you know, everyone, not just healthcare providers, understand that all those who wonder are not necessarily lost. And I think that's a excellent and lovely sentiment for us all to end on today. Um, really incredible work that Ron and Nolana have been doing. Thank you both for, for your excellent presentations in this conversation. I think you can see kind of the excitement and interest in the chat and uh, we hope to keep the conversation going and share those resources with you in the coming weeks.